and our registration table volunteer today and welcome you to our November forum. And I'd also like to welcome our guest to our November forum. Senator, I'm going to ask you all to put your cell phones on stun. <laughs> uh, uh, say that uh, we've got we've got a very good and important program today. Our head table, uh, I'll, I'll start to my left, is uh, Scott Jepson, who's Vice President of External Affairs and Transportation at ConocoPhillips, Alaska. And Scott is also a member of the Commonwealth North Board. To my far right is Marianne Peace, President of MAP Consulting, and she's also a Commonwealth North Board member and past president. Grant is chair of our Energy Action Coalition. And then uh, U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski, I'll introduce more formally in a moment, but ladies and gentlemen, uh, please help me uh, welcome our head table. Now we're going to move on quickly with the program while they serve lunch, but I want to thank each of you uh, for coming. And if uh, if you're a member of Commonwealth North, could you please stand? A member of Commonwealth North. I'd like to thank each of you for your membership and the tremendous work you've done today to, to, date to educate Alaskans, including our policy leaders. And if you're sitting, I'd like to invite you to join Commonwealth North. Uh, and, and I can just say this now that the election is behind us, I think. It's very, very important, the work that we've done, the homework that we've done, that we have ahead. We're going to talk to Senator Murkowski about a lot of important federal issues, federal state issues, where, where uh, Commonwealth North has weighed in in the past, uh, from the Arctic to natural gas to Anwar to Sturgeon to, to, to Katie Johnson's assistance. So, uh, a lot of issues where we're going to be working together with the Senator and uh, the rest of the Alaska delegation, and I think that's important. And likewise, we have a new governor who will be elected. We're going to do our best to make sure that that governor uh, uses this forum and this uh, 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 that, and works with this group in the same way that the last governor did because we have important decisions to be made on the permanent fund, on natural gas, on uh, expanding and developing Alaska's economy, on the, on the budget. And we have study groups on all those issues. And what I'm really saying here as a commercial is if you're not a member of Commonwealth North, this is a great time to join. And uh, the other thing I want to say is that there's question cards on your table, and if you have questions for the senator, uh, please uh, complete a yellow question card and hold them up, and Aaron, I think, will uh, we'll bring them down. So, Senator, I know they just put salad in front of you, but I'm going to uh, uh, introduce you and let you have this podium because I know there are a lot of questions. Senator Lisa Murkowski, you know, is a lifelong Alaskan. You know she's our first-born Alaska senator. You know she's our state's senior senator. You know when she's not in the state, and I think you probably have, are you a million miler yet on both Delta and Alaska? <laughs> uh, and she's not in the state. She's in Washington fighting hard for Alaska and pushing responsible development, trying to create jobs and improve America's energy independence. She's the chairman of both the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Interior and Environment. On the Energy Committee, she's held the position of either the chairman or the ranking member for the past 10 years. And she's known in the Senate for her ability to work with anybody, including across the aisle on common sense solutions. She's also responsible for one of the most remarkable U.S. Senate campaigns in national, in national history, when she won as a write-in Republican candidate in 2010. This fall, she celebrated her 31st anniversary with her husband, Vern Martell, and they have two sons, Matt, who owns and operates the Alaska Pasta Company, and Nick, who's uh, currently attending Williamit and uh, is uh, finishing a JE MBA. And I'll just say I happened to be in Iceland uh, listening to the senator speak uh, about two weeks ago, and I will just tell you that for one reason or another, we may get to that, uh, your, your global uh, recognition is, is strong. The president of Iceland stood up and uh, uh, spoke very highly of her. And I just want to say that I'm very proud we have here at Commonwealth North today uh, a speaker who it really is a global renown for her independence and uh, standing up. And Senator Lisa Murkowski, the podium is yours.
Mead, and uh, thank you to Commonwealth Club. Thank you to all of you. As I look around the room, there's a lot of leaders, there's a lot of leadership that uh, is present here, and I thank you for what it is that you do to make uh, Alaska our home, the place that we want to raise our families, uh, to use Glenn Killian's expression, Alaska, the place where I want to die. <laughs> okay, Glenn, I'm with you, because I'm not going anywhere either, and I know that so many of you have a similar view, but uh, uh, we've just kind of come off, kind of come off the election, what do you mean? We're all still kind of in the, in the post-election uh, junkie mode, if you will, I don't know about you, but I'm still doing the refresh, trying to see if there's anything new from Fairbanks with Kawasaki, Kelly Race, or in Arizona, or in Florida, so we'll get through that. But I want to, I'm going to begin my, my comments here today by acknowledging and just giving a shout out to, to those people that make it happen. And when you think about putting on an election, midterm elections, elections in the state, it's a lot of work. And the volunteers who work at the polling stations, who, who really just go about the work of, of allowing us to be able to exercise our, our rights as Americans and Alaskans, um, we need to show our appreciation to them and for them. We see, as we're looking at, at the, uh, the landscape across the country, administering an election is a hard task. It's a difficult task for the men and women who, who show up year after year to help out. And, uh, I, I just want to offer my appreciation to them. Um, I also want to thank the staff. And as our lieutenant governor, who was head of the Division of Elections, you know that there are a lot of people on the staff that go into making an execution of an election a good process. Uh, this year, we had a little bit of fun. I want to acknowledge Pat Race He's the guy who came up with the idea for the awesome I Voted Early stickers. It's, it's kind of cool when you get the attention from the state of Texas. <laughs> Apparently, the Houston Chronicle's headline was, Alaska's I Voted stickers are way cooler than ours. <laughs> so once again, we need Texas. <laughs> so, we also need to acknowledge those who, who, who ran for office those who have succeeded, and we have several in, in our presence here today. We have Senator Chris Birch over in the corner. We have Representative Jennifer Johnston. Who else could we have this? I think it's just the two of you. Um, but all of those who ran, all those who, who participated, win or lose, they contribute to a process. I really thank them for their willingness to serve. And of course, I'm sure that there is not one of you in this room that didn't volunteer or be voluntold to be part of some campaign or another. So you might have been out there with your no on one, you've got multiple college degrees, and what are you doing with it? You're waving signs in the dark. Thank you for what you do, because the enthusiasm helps. Uh, so now we're we're on the we're on the other side of what I think was a uh, hard election in many ways at the national level. Emotions were were pretty high. Uh, there was a great deal of division around the country, and we felt some of that certainly here. But when you think about what we've been through, when you think about kind of this, this process that can be messy and difficult. It's, it is through a process that is fair and free and inclusive when it comes to our elections that we really demonstrate who we are, the peaceful transition of power. This is, is really the best part of being an American and one that we have to commit to or recommit to every election cycle because it's not just about exercising the right to vote, as important as all that is. It also has to be what we then do the next day as citizens after that election as we move forward. 
we do it for our country, we do it for our state, we do it for our fellow fellow Americans and Alaskans. And so we're, we're now moving into that phase of our responsibility as, as citizens. What do we do next? Well, I wish that I could tell you, take a deep breath. There's going to be a long pause between now and the next election. False. The ink is not even dry. Uh, they're still counting absentees. There's recounts likely in a couple races. But we're already, we're already seeing the articles that are prognosticating about who's going to run for president in 2020, about who already has the early lead, for gosh sakes. Can't somebody declare first before we declare them in the early lead? Talking about what their platform's going to be, who they're going to appeal to. This, this pressure, the pressure of a perpetual campaign is very real. It is everywhere. And I think, I think that is eroding part of what makes our country great, is this perpetual campaign cycle. I was down in uh, California a uh, week or 10 days or so ago. I was speaking at the Stanford Global Energy Forum, close to the global role that, that I play. Um, I'm so excited to be there. I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a fireside chat with George Schultz. You know, this is meaty, substantive stuff. We're going to talk about the pioneering in innovation that's going on in our state um, with, with the microgrids and the renewable energy that we have, about what we're doing to reduce the footprint of our, of our development on the North Slope, the challenges of climate change, the importance of the Arctic as, as we are emerging in this very, very critical global role. And what's the one question that I get from the reporter as I'm going up to go speak? She wants to know, she wants to know, did I get some kind of a trade for this or that? It was an absolutely <coughs> cynical, politically cynical question. It didn't have anything to do about what we were there to discuss. It was all about whether or not she could get a gotcha. Well, I know I had my share over the, over the years um, that I've been in the Senate. I've had my share from those who will question what they believe to be my short-sightedness on some of my decisions. I know that the very deliberative process that I go through on most issues can be frustrating, frustrating to others, because they just want me to pick a side. Just pick yes or no. Make it simple. Well, my friends, so many of these issues are just not simple. And it's the political cynicism that keeps further dividing us on this. So, so where do we go? What's the takeaway from <coughs> the elections other than that we here in this country are clearly divided um, and that there's political cynicism out there? So there's still, there's still races to be decided, but what is clear obviously, is that the Democrats uh, will have control of the House come January, the Republicans will have control of the Senate. Arizona and Florida, still too close to call. I had a conversation with, a, with uh, one of my colleagues from Arizona this morning, and uh, he's saying it doesn't look good for the Republican at this point in time. We've got some new numbers in today, but it's still going to be uh, a fair amount of time, probably another week, before we know for sure on that. Uh, Florida, of course, is still out there. Missouri, excuse me, Mississippi. We anticipate that Cindy Hyde Smith will win, win that run, runoff. But we could be sitting anywhere with a 54, 53 majority in the Senate. The Democrats uh, have up to a 237 uh, member majority in the House. So we're going to be a divided government. The last time we had a Republican president and a Republican senator, Senate and a Democrat House was back in 1982, Reagan administration. So think back to 1982. That was just after Frank Murkowski got into office. Ted Stevens was the majority whip in the Senate. And what did they accomplish? They successfully passed the Social Security Amendments of 1983, and they raised the minimum drinking age. So there's your political history. 
I don't know what <laughs> portends for us, but it's an interesting factoid. But I, I am one who believes very, very strongly that with a divided landscape, what we do is we don't say nothing can be done. What we do is we look for the opportunities to unify around shared goals and opportunities for bipartisan leadership. And I think that this is where we need to continue to be focused. It's not on what is it that we can't do, but more importantly, what can we do and what will we do. The president has already named a couple areas where I think um, we've got some promise here. The first that I'm particularly pleased about is prescription drug pricing. Um, this is something that I've been working on in the health committee with colleagues for some years now. Uh, it's an area where I think we can find common ground. We also have, we're moving, we're going to be shifting from this, this uh, pressure that we had had of, of repealing the ACA to one where I believe we're going to be focused on, on stabilizing the markets in the, in the individual plans, the legislation that Senator Alexander and Senator Murray have been working on last year to allow for more affordable plans and again increase competition. I think these are areas where you're going to see some progress. Everybody wants to talk about infrastructure. We all love to build things. Let's do more infrastructure. Um, I want to talk about infrastructure, absolutely, but I'm also very cognizant that we've got a deficit that we also have to address. And so I'm, I'm somewhat in the skeptical camp in terms of being able to find a pathway that can be meaningful for rural states like Alaska. And uh, uh, I think we look for other ways then that we can make sure that we have that good, strong support for infrastructure projects in the state. What we've done is we've done that through the regular appropriations process. We've increased allocations to uh, infrastructure programs. And that, I think, is more where the infrastructure opportunity lies for us. But we have, we have to reassert our power in the legislative branch to be the body that sets the legislative spending priorities. This means bringing back earmarks. You're going to hear me say the word. Look at it. Think about it. We're a pretty unique state here. We say it all the time. But if we're trying to advance things like Arctic ports, let's just use that as an example, and we have to compete in a formula that is designed to measure how things look today, how are we ever going to move out on an Arctic park? Our job must be to invest in, in the future to drive how things will be. And so making sure that we return to that, that goal, that responsibility that is laid out in our Constitution that says that the legislative branch is the one that sets the spending priorities. What we did, what we as Republicans did some years back was to say there's too much dark stuff that's going on with, with appropriations, so we need to get rid of earmarks. What we needed to do was to do what we were, what we were directing ourselves to do, which was to increase the transparency, have it be wide open to the world. That's what we did. When you came to my office with a project, we wanted to know where the support was, whether or not you had resolutions from your from your community council, whether your legislators had lined it up, what the governor said about it. We had a process. And there was nothing dark rooms, smoky rooms about it. So making sure that we are setting the priorities rather than just ceding this to the agencies is where I think we need to get back to. But I think, I think that when we're talking about infrastructure and projects and, and what we're going to be doing to, to build out, all you need to do is look to the Appropriations Committee and what we have been doing on a bipartisan basis to see that we're already demonstrating that we can be working together on some of these hard, hard issues. Senator Leahy and Senator Shelby, two of the two of the old bulls, Ted's contemporaries. Um, they said, "No, we're gonna we're gonna figure out how we can return to some semblance of, of regular order," and and they have done that. 
It meant that we had to stand down on some of the things that all of us would have liked to include. But we needed to get to a place where we were processing moving through appropriations bills. And we're, we're in a pretty good place right now. We, we have advanced about 75% of the discretionary spending on, on the budget side. We passed and signed into law the defense uh, approach, energy and water, labor, HHS, education, uh, MILCON VA, and legislative branch. So those are all done. Those are in law. Packaged up and, and pretty much ready to go is, is my subcommittee, Interior, along with financial services, uh, transportation, housing, and then agriculture. So we'll be working on those when we get back next week. So that leaves three, three uh, subcommittees, CJS, Homeland Security, and state and foreign ops that we have to finish up. So we, again, we were able to move most of these bills through the Senate with broad bipartisan support because we agreed that we had to put aside our controversial provisions. We need to focus on getting things done. We funded the remaining agencies through December 7th, and we've got to, we've got to tackle just a few few key ones. We've got that uh, border security that we have to address, but we also have my favorite border issue, which is our, our floating northern border wall, is what I'm calling our iceberg. <laughs> Think about that. We need to take care of the northern border, too, so what better way to do it than a solid iceberg? So we're going to be working on that. Energy Committee is doing well. We've been really very productive. We don't make a lot of the headlines because we just keep moving things through and getting them signed into law. We advanced nearly 160 bills to the full Senate. Many of these have, have been signed into law. We've got more to do, but we're just focusing on creating jobs, boosting mineral and energy production, uh, innovation, providing for multiple use, public use recreation, we're conveying federal lands to, to community development, we're protecting our treasured lands. We're doing good things. More, more local to home here, we have Senator Sullivan's um, Native Veteran Allotment Bill. We've got right away for the gas line through, through Denali. We've got BLM permitting for small miners, uh, maintenance for the national parks. These are all things that most look at and say, well, that's not really Republican, that's not really Democrat. Hmm, maybe we just ought to just pass that. What a concept. What a concept. And of course, I've never given up on my energy bill. Long overdue, and we're going to keep working it, keep working it, keep working it. But I think it's important for you all to know that there's more that is happening across party lines than the news will actually share with you. Just last week, um, or no, no, last week we finished the FAA authorization before we came, but next week when we get back, uh, Tuesday evening, we're going to be moving to take a Coast Guard reauthorization bill that has some good stuff that Senator Sullivan, Congressman Young, and myself have been working on. Um, but right up, right up to the election, well, everyone was fixated. On, on the division in Washington, we passed out the NDAA, which is the defense authorization, which gave our, our troops um, the first pay increase in like 10 years, uh, a significant veterans um, choice legislation, right to try legislation, WERDA, which is the Water Resources um, Infrastructure Bill. Uh, I mentioned the FAA reauthorization, has significant pro uh, provisions for Alaska, and then we passed um, a really monumental opioids package. And, and again, we did that all while everyone was saying, Congress is a mess, nobody can even walk on the same side of the street as one another. So it, it is important to keep that in mind. The delegation is, is uh, we're small, but Mike, let's just put it that way. <laughs> and it's, we, we are, we are uniquely poised um, in terms of where we position our, our interests. Um, Senator Sullivan is, is sitting there on Commerce, Armed Services, EPW, and Vets. Uh, as as Mead mentioned, I've been either the chair or the ranking on energy for a decade now. I don't understand how, how that can be, because it seems like I've only been in the Senate for six years, but whatever. <laughs> but, then, but then the Appropriations Committee help Indian Affairs and then, of course, Don. We just give Don the whole entire house and say, go fix it, Don. But, uh, but we do have a, a, a good relationship with one another. We do have a good relationship with the administration. 
And, and going into a divided Congress, I think we have positioned ourselves well as that team that just kind of figures out who they need to get along with to, to make some things happen. And so when you think about when you think about what's happening right now in the administration, a lot of turnover, a lot of turnover. We can talk about that in the, in the questions and answers here. But some would say, well, that's just going to hold things up. It's going to slow things down. I look at that as an opportunity to bring in some of these, these new individuals who will be up for these positions to say, OK, what is your Arctic priority? What do you know about Alaska? How can you help us with uh, with some of our infrastructure needs. So this is about educating nominees and, and forming some good relationships. Um, we, we, we're in the business, Senator McConnell says that the Senate is in the personnel business. And this means we're gonna be working on more judicial noms. It means we're going to be working on executive cabinet members and an agency. When we get back next week on Thursday, we're going to have a, confirmation hearing the Energy Committee and take up the, uh, the, the nominee at the FERC. Um, pretty important to us. If you haven't read the news, we have a pending application for the FERC. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's kind of important that they have a full complement. This LNG application is, uh, is, let's just say, it's sizable. And making sure that they've got a full team is going to be important. We need to make sure that we not only are working with the agencies to ensure we've got a project in place when the permits are secured and the construction decision can then be made by Alaska. So this is, this is again, just one more indicator of the personnel business. On judges, we have processed 29 circuit court judges and 53 district court judges in just these first two years in the Trump administration. So moving, moving quickly through, through the nominees. So wherever we end up, whether it is 53 in the Senate, 54 in the Senate, no matter where the majority ends up, it's still going to require. It's still going to require working across the aisle, working together to, to advance the solutions to Alaska's challenges, our opportunities, our problems, and the countries. And, and I think we've got an opportunity in this lame duck to demonstrate, just as we have on so many of the big issues that, that we already face this Congress, that we can keep this momentum going. We can, we can go into a new year, a new Congress, with that willingness to, to work. There will always, there will always, always be pressures that are going to be pulling us apart. There is going to be this perpetual emphasis on election strategies, strategies by, by the pundits that are out there. But what we need to do as Alaskans, as Americans, we just need to block out the noise and we just need to get to work. And that's my commitment going into, into this next phase. I want to just quickly acknowledge those who help me get to work every day. Um, a few key members of my team are with me here. Uh, Mike Blowski, Fish, the Chief of Staff, is, uh, is in the back and uh, been doing a great job with me in this Congress. Uh, Karina uh, now Borger is my um, communications director back in Washington, D.C. Layla Kimbrell is my state director here in Anchorage, but really all around the state. And I also want to acknowledge Kevin Sweeney. Kevin, as you know, uh, was my state director for a long, long time. Um, he's been instrumental in my campaigns, and, and he married well. Uh, his wife, Tara, of course, is now helping uh, lead within the Department of Interior. And Kevin is going to be spending more time back in Washington, D.C., uh, starting his, his business interests there and uh, but still working with many of you. So you know, you know where, where we're taking him. With that need, I am super excited to take any questions that anybody might have about anything except what that snarky question was from that reporter. <laughs> You and uh, Aaron's bringing up some others, so I'll ask you in a non snarky way. Okay. Can you explain to us uh, why did you vote against uh, Judge Kavanaugh and uh, Justice Kavanaugh, and how do you come to the 
decisions like that. Is that snarky? No, it's not snarky at all. Um, and I'm glad that it's our first question because uh, it allows me, I think, to, to speak a little bit about my process when I'm dealing with difficult decisions as well as, as how I came down to my decision, a very difficult decision on Kavanaugh. I have had an opportunity now to vote on six Supreme Court justices. Six. And I think I have pretty high standards when it comes to judicial nominees, not all judicial nominees, but particularly the Supreme Court. We are talking about the highest court in the land. We are talking about a lifetime appointment to nine individuals. And so it is, it is critical that we have high standards going into an appointment on the court. For me, it is also critically important that our judiciary be impartial, be independent from the political bias that, uh, that we see within the legislative branch and the executive branch. By their very nature, the legislative branch is political. By its very nature, the executive is as well. But by its construct, the judiciary was designed to be that independent, unbiased branch of government. That's separate but equal, but unbiased. And so as we had as we went through that that process of evaluation, it was not just about it's not just about the qualifications in terms of academic background. Uh, cases, <laughs> cases that he had weighed in on, but it was also, it was also temperament, it was also independence. And it became clear to me that, that Judge Kavanaugh did not meet that highest of standards, which I, I require. And I, I take the role of advice and consent that I have as a senator to, to be one of the most significant responsibilities that I have. Legislation comes and goes. We have an opportunity to vote on something we may find a few years later that, that we needed to change that, to recalibrate it. This is a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land. So I determined that, that Judge Kavanaugh could not meet that high standard that I have for independence and impartiality free from political bias. So I made a very, diff diff very, very difficult decision to vote against him. He is now seated on the court, and my hope, my absolute fervent hope, is that Judge Ka Justice Kavanaugh proves me wrong, that he acts with absolute integrity, independence, <coughs> and, and impartiality because the court needs that and the country needs that. So that was, that was why I came to the decision that I did. But I think equally important is the second half of your question there, Mead, about how, what do you do when you have a, um, a truly consequential, very difficult issue? Um, I, I have always taken very seriously my, resp my responsibility as your elected representative to, to deliberate on all the issues that, that I take. And I've been accused by, by many, by my staff, uh, my colleagues, certainly the media, that I'm too reflective, I'm too thorough, I take too long. They want me to, to, to basically put my, get my intentions into their timelines. And that's not something that should be, that should be my criteria. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that I can't make quick decisions. I absolutely can. But on, on issues that, uh, again, are, are, are very compelling and very 
significant and serious. I feel I have an obligation to be as thorough as I possibly can. And when the answers are not so clear, it is, it is even more important to make sure that I take the time to, to really decide how to best represent the people in the state. And, and, and clearly, the Kavanaugh confirmation is one of those points in time. Um, so I deliberated. I deliberated, I, I investigated, I read, I consulted, I met with the judge uh, on more than one occasion. I talked, I listened to Alaskans from all over the state uh, with, with varying views about Judge Kavanaugh and, and, and where he was coming from. I'll tell you, the easiest thing for me to do, you've seen the press clips, you know what was going on back in Washington, D.C. The easiest thing for me to do would have been to vote the party line. And I think that, that any, of, any of you who have followed my last two elections, I guess, um, you know that if Alaskans wanted someone in this seat to just check in with their party leader for instructions on how to vote, I wouldn't be serving in the Senate party. I just wouldn't. I, I am an independent legislator, and I don't hide my independence. I embrace it. And I believe that most Alaskans appreciate that. I hope they respect me for it. And I hope that it doesn't make a difference if you are, are a nonpartisan or member of a political party. Now, you've all been with me for a while. There's no mistake here. I am a Republican. I haven't switched my parties. I'm not going to switch my party. I'm a Republican because of what I believe in, in the values of, of fiscal conservatism, of, of resource development, um, that the government is not the solution to every, every problem out there. But at the end of the day, what I identify with is I'm an Alaskan. I'm an Alaskan first, and I'm going to work to put the interests of our people, the people our state first. And for me, that's that's my guiding principle. And I realize that this does not please everybody. I realize I can't please everybody. I realize that on one day, I'm going to make half the people really happy, and then the next day, they're going to be crazy mad with me. I I understand that uh, that in this position, there's a yes, there's a no. And there's nothing in between. And so what I have to do is I have to do my due diligence. I have to deliberate. I have to be thoughtful. I have to listen. And then I have to exercise my best judgment. And so at the end of it all, I keep coming back to, to Ted's Ted's admonition to me, and I think to all of us, when he just said, to hell with politics, let's just do what's best for Alaska. And that's, that should be a good guiding principle for all of us. So I apologize to you that I took so long on that answer, but it, it's something that people, people have been talking about, and perhaps if they haven't been talking about it, they've been thinking about it. So now we've, uh, we've had the chance to hear it. Thank you, Senator. Um, there have been a, there are a number of questions here about the work on the Senate Energy Committee, so um, and, uh, thank you for that for the answer. Uh, it's really about kind of personalities in the, in the next Congress. Uh, one, your thoughts on the increase of women in the two bodies as to the overall culture of the old boys club. Another question, uh, the House Resources Chair, I'm not sure how to pronounce the old name for yeah, yeah. So, so you have a new House Resources Chair to work with on energy legislation, and then uh, Deborah Stavenow is probably going to replace Maria Campbell as the ranking member. Can you comment on that? Uh, general question was asked on your goals as chair of the Senate Energy Committee, and. Uh, uh, question was asked is, uh, is uh, 
Secretary Zinke soon to leave and what's next there. <laughs> okay. All right. These are all fun ones. So let me go with Zinke first because uh, in fairness, I can honestly say I don't know. But uh, there's a lot of scuttlebutt going on right now. Where, what, three days after the election, we've seen the Attorney General um, submit his resignation. There's a buzz about Zinke. I don't know. Um, uh, my hope is that the secretary is able to stay in place. He's been, uh, he's been a good secretary to work with. He has assembled, in my view, a great team that is working hard for Alaska and also for the broader, uh, the broader initiative of energy independence throughout the country. Um, but you know, Washington is a fickle place. They say if you want a friend, you need to get a dog. And uh, uh, I, I don't know what will happen to Secretary Zinke. I was quite stunned, actually, to hear that he was talking with folks at Fox, but maybe that was just made up. Uh, we don't know about that. Other rumors. you got to love the speculation about rumors, because <clears throat> right now there is buzz going on about well, what's the makeup of the energy committee going to look like if Florida goes to the Republican. So for those of you who haven't been tracking this, my, my ranking member, Senator Cantwell from Washington, will have an opportunity to take over as ranking on commerce if Nelson loses. And I think that she would probably move over to commerce uh, if she's given that opportunity. So then the way it works on the Democrat side is you move up based on seniority. Next to Cantwell is Wyden. He's already happy at finance, so he's going to stay put there. Then it's, uh, it's Debbie Stabenow after that. She is, she is ranking on agriculture. They're kind of stuck with their farm bill right now, so I don't know whether she's fed up with it and she wants to come to a great place like Energy and, and work with me on some of, you know, some of the things that, that uh, uh, perhaps are not as divisive as, uh, as SNAP programs, but we'll see. Uh, after, if she should turn that down, um, uh, the next in line is Bernie Sanders. Uh, that would be, you know, I'm, I am one who declares that she can work with just about anybody. That would be um, uh, a test <laughs> for me. But, Hey, I'm sure we can find something to, to, to work on as well. And then, if Bernie skips that because he wants to stay ranking on budget, which he should, um, then who do I get? My dream ticket, Joe Manchin from West Virginia, who was our one and wore a vote uh, on the Democrat side. So uh, that's what we're dreaming about. In terms of uh, the committee itself and um, where, how we move forward, some of the some of the things that we have teed up, we have been working through in this lame duck period, uh, trying to build a pretty strong public lands package that we'll be able to advance before year end, and uh, are, are working with our counterparts on the house side to to advance that. Um, we have some other initiatives that are underway. Um, we've been working with the administration on a pretty significant bill that would address the maintenance of backlog within our national parks. Um, that, that is significant. Uh, from my perspective and where we move next year in the, uh, in the new Congress, I'd like to think that we've cleared our plate with our energy bill and we can start fresh with some of those initiatives. Uh, but we have, we have a great deal of work to do in the energy space, whether it is issues of reliability, of, of uh, reliability and resiliency of energy, grid security, um, cyber security issues, um, grid modernization, uh, what we are able to do to, to help advance opportunities uh, that we have in a state like Alaska when it comes to, to microgrids and renewables, what we are doing to, to better facilitate uh, our opportunities for, for sharing of our resources, whether it's Alaska oil or, or natural gas, uh, the LNG export issues. So we've got we've got a full plate on energy and are ready to go. And trying to intersect as much of that as we can with our Arctic agenda. 
Well, there was a question on the art agenda. I, I didn't put this in, Senator, ah. but uh, uh, the question is, uh, there are 40, 50, 60 icebreakers in Russia, depending on whether uh, Vladimir Putin or the United States is doing the counting. Uh, the U.S. has got one icebreaker, and with the deficit, how is the U.S. going to build even one or more at the billion dollars a pop? And you and I have also talked about some other financing mechanisms. You know, if we're helping China sell so goods to France, we ought to be able to fight the tariffs. So, well, and these are these are the conversations that we need to have with an administration that is focused on on the challenges and the opportunities that we're seeing in the Arctic, and. It is, it, it's a fair question to ask because an icebreaker, although we decided that maybe we shouldn't call it an icebreaker, we need to call it a polar security cutter. <laughs> I'm all about changing the names if it gets me what we're looking for. <laughs> um, and, and quite honestly, when you're building, when you're building a, an icebreaker one at a time, it's, it's pretty tough to, to get, quote, a deal. So how we move forward with an icebreaking fleet is part of our challenge. But one icebreaker is not a fleet. And that right now is, is, is what we've been kind of wrestling with. As Mead mentions, there are, there are financing oppor opportunities. There are, there are some out of the box ideas that we might be able to pursue that, will, that can help us advance uh, a, a ice-breaking fleet in this country, but we have to have the commitment to do it. And if you don't have if you don't have leadership that believes that this is an issue, it's pretty tough to get anybody to agree that this is where we're going to spend our resources. And so this is this is truly kind of one of those all hands on deck with the Department of Defense who is coming to the table. The Coast Guard, the uh, whether it's commerce, everyone, everyone has to be in the same place, or at least getting to the same place, in understanding that as an Arctic nation, we cannot be sitting back with one icebreaker. We can count it. The Russians can't count it because they're moving ahead, and so. This is something that I continue to struggle with with this administration, and in fairness, with this administration and the prior administration and the prior administration before that one, is, is raising the level of awareness and the opportunities that we have as an organization right now. So we're not there yet. Um, we can talk about leasing, we can talk about tariffs, we've got lots of, of opportunities, but we need people in this country to understand how this is a national priority and not an Alaskan year Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions and I could do that thing they do us in debates to say yes, no, but I'm uh, just ask you, if you address the earmarks issue, uh, the deficit grew by 17% last year. Uh, the, the national debt is now over 21 trillion. Twenty-one trillion dollars, and, and I guess the question is, um, and a, a, another question asked is, tax cuts have led to huge federal deficits. If infrastructure is a priority, how do you come forward with this problem? Are there any? Is there anything that can be done essentially to put sidewalks in on federal spending so that? We know that the economy is going to be okay, and yet address these needs that you seriously need to be addressed. Well, I don't remember how many years it's been, um, but uh, it's been years now um, that we had an opportunity to vote on um, a constitutional amendment, spending, basically a spending amendment. Um, so there, I mean, in terms of sidebars, the, the question is, there are ways that we can do it. I, I think what we need to do is, is, is make sure that we're actually working to address the debt and the deficit instead of saying that that will be a subject or an issue for another day. Uh, in fairness, 
we, we in the Congress, uh, the administration, this has not been a has not been a priority, and I think I think you saw that um, uh, not only again not only in this these past two years, but those numbers don't go up by accident, and and getting them under control, getting our our, our deficit <coughs> under control is going to require a, a concerted effort. Um, our reality, though, is we can talk about cuts within discretionary programs, and Chris and Jennifer know this, uh, but it's not, it's not the discretionary side that is, the, is, is what's running up these numbers. It is on the mandatory side. It is, it is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Uh, it, is, it is these programs that are effectively on, on autopilot in that your legislators do not raise them or lower them. They just increase because of the formulas and the populations. And so these are the very, very, very difficult conversations that that must take place in order to, to rein this in. Now, that you threw in the question on the, or the reference to the, to the tax reform bill. Uh, I am one who, who believes that we have not yet seen the pos m more of the positive impacts from that tax, uh, tax cut and reform package. Uh, as we see, as we see um, uh, more taking taking uh, place next year or coming into effect next year, I think we're going to see some of the benefits that were promised. Um, but right now, it is it's it's kind of a tough place from the perspective of those who are saying we have to advance uh, infrastructure to build out a strong economy, but how are you going to pay for it? It goes back to my comments where I said, I worry, I'm a little bit skeptical about rural states like ours. If you're back east and you've got, you've got a lot of folks and you can put in toll roads that will pay for themselves, it works. It makes sense. You can do it. We can't do that here. I don't know anybody that's willing to, to pay for tolls that will be steep enough to really facilitate some of our smaller roads and smaller projects. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left, but uh, one thing just to what you just said is asked uh, uh, we were cut out of the Bureau of Reclamation funding at statehood because we were getting a 90-10 on our revenues and we were not keeping 90-10 on our revenues either in MR or in PRA. Should we get back into the reclamation funding? Would that help us with infrastructure? <coughs> through that statehood compact, the promises made, promises not delivered, and, 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 and trying to think how we can do better by our state. Um, we're still dealing with the university lands issues. Um, Je Jesse knows that full well. Um, we have our uh, land, land acceleration, Alaska Lands Acceleration Act. The, legislation that I passed back in 2004 that said, by gosh, by our 50th anniversary of statehood, the, the, the lands conveyances that were promised to us will be completed. Well, we're beyond that, and we're still not completed. And there are still promises that have been made that have not yet been kept. And we're working to chip away at them. But I will just share with you some of the frustration uh, as an Alaskan that we have in getting even, even this most seemingly small promises honored. Under uh, the Native, Native Land Claim Settlement Act, uh, our Native people were entitled to, to, um, to lay claims to their Native areas. This all was taking place at the time that the uh, Vietnam War was going on, and those who were serving, our Alaska Native vets who were serving in Vietnam, weren't able to make their selections. And so they have, for decades now, come to, to the Alaska delegation and said, 
it's not right that that because we were serving our country, we were not able to to help or to claim our birthright as Alaska Natives. Can you address this? We're talking. We are talking. 3,500 Alaska Natives. It is not a growing pool. It is a shrinking pool. And it is not as if these are these are um, allotments that will, will gut the, uh, the the federal lands in our state. But we cannot get we cannot get folks on the other side of the aisle to acknowledge that this commitment that was made to these veterans who served should be kept because there are those who just firmly believe that no acre of federal land should be transferred from a federal account to a private account because maybe that individual is going to cut a tree on his land. Maybe that individual is going to to do a little bit of placer mining on her land. I, I don't know what the fear is, but it, it just speaks to the broader problem as Alaskans in, in ensuring that our state could promise us How do you be sure this organization will be there to review the state promises? Um, I'm going to read just uh, the last question so you hear the questions and concerns from the audience today. You can address any or all of them. Uh, one is, will the change to the Affordable Care Act uh, protect people with existing health conditions? You can say yes or no. Um, uh, legislation. We have to. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, legislation on uh, Katie John, where uh, if the Sturgeon case goes forward, uh, water rights, we, we think we got control of navigable waters for statehood. Uh, the feds are taking it back uh, on the Hovercraft case, but they also kind of took them back uh, on, the, on the Katie John case. Uh, what should that end up to be? Uh, Senator, do you think there's any appetite for amending or updating the Jones Act? Uh, get past the restrictions of the Jones Act. Another question is, uh, where do you think the Mueller Russian investigation is going? Uh, can we uh, can we the time limit allowed for campaigning and declaring candidacy for election so there can be more focus on governing? And uh, I, so I, I, because of that question, I didn't ask you my wife's question, which is, are you running for president? Uh, and uh, would you, uh, would you consider an earmark to provide a basic minimum level of community support for Alaska's rural communities? So take your pick. Uh, just because, just because we're still kind of in the in the post-election um, junkie syndrome, where we got to be checking checking where where all the numbers are still. Um, it's this it's this never-ending political. Cycle that we have, have just joined. I don't. I don't know how we. I don't know how we unravel it. How we stop it. But I. I. I really have a problem with waking up on Wednesday morning and knowing that we're we're, we're talking about the next set of elections. I think people just need to read from politics, and if they don't. If they don't, you all then become like, like us in Congress. Where when I am introduced, I'm not introduced as as Lisa Murkowski, um, Ketchikan, Alaska, mom of two kids, wife of Vern. I'm introduced as Lisa Murkowski, R, Alaska. And then they put my name in, or my agent, just to kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. If, if every one of you in this room felt like that your identifier, right off the bat, needed to be a political affiliation so that you could have a conversation with somebody, so that somebody could size you up right away and put you in that box or put you in that box, how are we ever going to have a conversation? How are we ever going to deal with issues, whether it is the debt and the deficit, or whether it is climate change, or whether it is it is build a, you know, a new tax reform. If we have decided where you are before you've even opened your mouth, because you, my next door neighbor, I know what you are. I know that you're a Republican. I know that you're a Democrat. And so I'm going to form my opinions about you early, and I'm going to keep them that way. 
And, and I think these never-ending political campaigns keep us in, in, in these lanes. And believe me, I'm, I am proud to be a Republican. I have been one since I was able to register at 18. And I look at it, and there are things that are not the same way that they were when I was 18 in my party. That means that there's some things I don't like about my party, and there's some people I don't like in my party. But you know what? I could say that about my family. I am not we have got, we have got to, to allow ourselves not only time from elections. As, as lawmakers, we need to allow ourselves time to govern without the, 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 the constant churn of the campaign. But I think we also need to, as Americans, remember that the world is not divided in, in, in red and blue and Republican and Democrat. It shouldn't be divided that way. It should be, what kind of a neighbor are you? Are you a good dad? Are you, are you, do you clean your neighbor's fish? Why, why do we have to be so, so politically aligned and politically divided? And I get called Pollyanna. I get called just too rosy-eyed. But I have to be, because I work in a place where it's pretty cutthroat. And I am eyes wide open, but I have to believe in the greater good of everybody. And I don't care what your political affiliation is. So I hope that we can just kind of stand down just a little bit and uh, uh, breathe, block out the noise, and just be good Alaskans. that uh, Kyle Thorth is delighted to have you. Uh, this podium is open to you anytime. Please use us uh, as uh, you grapple some of the difficult decisions that you got uh, coming down. Uh, Scott Kendall is here, our Governor's Chief of Staff. Scott, you've been at this podium before. I want to thank you and the Governor for using this podium uh, over the last four years, uh, I believe, constructively, uh, and welcome you back to, to this organization. And uh, for those of you who haven't got all your Christmas shopping done, there's a map on an easel back there that was the map used uh, by Mr. Sumner to justify purchasing Alaska during a long debate in Congress. Um, and uh, it's signed by all the living former governors, and that's a Commonwealth North keepsake that you can pass on to your family. And uh, see Aaron, Aaron, raise your hand. Uh, uh, if you'd like a copy, you can get one on the way out. And thank you again all for joining us today, and uh, I'd like to encourage you to become a member of Commonwealth North. When you do, you become a member of a bipartisan organization in the spirit that you just mentioned, uh, an organization that was founded by our first two governors of this state, a Republican and a Democrat. And uh, we have uh, worked very hard to be a constructive forum where you can address Alaska's issues and bring people to the table, and we're honored to have you here today. We're dismissed. Thank you.